hello and welcome to part 9D of our reading of the Magdalene Manuscript. Uh, we're in the section of One Woman Story. If you have missed the previous episodes, there is a link down in the description box below, both on YouTube and on Rumble, where you can find the previous episodes. So today we're going to get started on page 222. And I had been called by an island in the northern sky and by a great teacher in the wind. A few months after my Chicateague experience, I saw a video that sounded a lot like my teacher in the wind. And so it was that I packed up my daughters, closed my business, bought a van, and packed it for the road trip. I was going west to write the teachings of this great master and to work on my unfinished business so that I would be ready. There are memories I hold dearly from that cross-country trip with a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. We camped at night, our modest older Volkswagen West follow wedge between huge converter buses and motor mansions. Linen tablecloths and silver goblets emerged from our turtle shell, and while our neighbors stuffed themselves in plastic chairs outside of their 200,000 motor home guzzling beer, we breakfast on Egg Benedict and served our grilled cheese sandwich with our crust trims and drank our tea from silver goblets. I sat in a pool of water beneath Horseshoe Falls in West Virginia the day my briefing was given to the executive branch of the White House, laughing under the pelting warm water. I could have stayed for, for a briefing for the glory of saying I'd been there, but I chose the waterfall instead. It was the 4th of July, 1986, and it seemed a more fitting statement to make about freedom to sit on a waterfall rather than to sit in the Oval Office of the Reagan White House. I experienced my first ever migraine in Elk Creek, Kentucky. My head was pounding and I thought I'd better stop driving. It was early afternoon when we pulled into the Elk Creek campground. I picked a campsite as the blinding pain sent me driving underneath covers for darkness. Next door to our camping site, Elsa permanently camped every summer. She strung Christmas tree lights and had fake grass laid out on the, on the entire breadth of her space. Her wooden sign announced her encampment to the constant stream of family and guest. As I passed out from the pain, I held a vague memory of seeing Jenny and Adrian wander over and enter Elsa's picket fence where she held court on a lawn chair picking beans, a little chihuahua by her side. I awoke hours later, electrically rewired as I was to be for years from these headaches that always took me down for what seemed like days. I was horrified. How long had I slept? Where were the girls? I had no intention of letting them out of my sight on this trip, having heard so many horror stories of children disappearing on their way to the bathroom at a campground. I pulled back the curtain on the van window and allowed the, wanting, and allowed the waning light of dust to penetrate my optic nerve, only wincing slightly. There were the girls picking beans with Elsa next door. God, I thought, what on earth will she think of me? I've been gone for however long, asleep in a van while my children roamed around. She was an older woman, and I learned to be frightened of them, having been raised by one. I stumbled my way to the door and over through the little gate beneath Elsa's place at Elk Creek sign. The girls greeted me excitedly and begged to show me the tricks Elsa's chihuahua could do. Elsa agreed, and they dispatched the little dog to fetch a drink. The little snippet of short white hair raced into the camping trailer and dragged out a can of beer. Ferociously, he growled and menaced and dragged the can back and forth across the fake grass, slamming it into the lawn chairs, clawing and scratching at its pop-up until it began to leak beer. Gleefully, he then lay back, pulling the can over him, catching every drop as gravity drew the liquid down his throat. So... Elsa said to me, the girls tell me you're taking them off to some island way up in northern sky, smack dab in the middle of nowhere. You got a good reason for doing that? Fear clutched at my throat. Was she going to judge me for this? Was I going to buckle under scrutinization? Could I think of some lie to justify this action on my part? No, I heard myself say, I don't have a good reason for doing this. I just want to. Good, Elsa said. I never saw happiness come from anything done for a good reason. I knew then we were on a magical journey of spirit, not mind. It continued from philosophical conversations with old folk singers on a riverboat along the Missouri to saving a frog in a whirlwind on the White River in the Badlands in South Dakota. I like Missoula, Montana so much that I got down on my knees in front of the van outside of a Chinese restaurant and cut it a deal. 
I promised my van that whenever it broke down, I'd consider that as a sign that we were supposed to stay there. Then I started the engine, silently hoping it wouldn't start. It started. We continue until we ran out of land at the edge of a little town in northern Washington state. We boarded a ferry on the way to the island whose I call I heard all the way back east. The three of us huddled against the wind in the bow of the boat and sobbed at the recognition as home approached. Here my heart sang. Here my soul breathed with joy and recognized divinity. Here where cliffs met the sea entwined with a chain as ancient as memory, I found some sense of place I had never known before. But no one was expecting us. There were no banners out that read, welcome, we have been waiting for your arrival. Sit down now and write the books you were called to write. Here's your paycheck. Reluctantly, we stayed as long as we could. But since no one made an offer, we headed off, either to the southwest or home. We could make that decision along the way. But we were so close to a huge snow cone called Mount Rainier that I couldn't see how we could just be that close and not climb it. It was, after all, right there in front of us, begging for a pilgrimage. Alas, after climbing all the way up, the engine finally blew on the way down. And there we were, stranded. Or was it gifted? A blown engine would take a minimum of two weeks. I called home and had the same experience we had nightly when we tried to call. We got the phone machine. When I finally got through to the girl's father, telling him we were stranded, he didn't say, oh, let me fly out and take care of this. Are you all right? What can I do to help you? Let me fly you home right now. Instead, he said, so what does this mean to me? We never returned. Through the next five years, I was a single mother living with eagles and whales on the island in Northern Sky. Since their father was on the other coast, he wasn't around to take them on weekends or overnight. So there were no off nights for me. No weekends alone. Life was full time. All the ear infections continued. Through all the born-again virgin years, I had one mantra. I repeated this mantra over and over to myself. I repeated it in the bathtub, on hikes up the mountain, on the way to school to pick up the girls, everywhere. I must have said this at least 20 times a day for those five years. From the Lord God of my being unto the mother father within, I call forth all my unfinished business. Bring it forward. Bring it forward, anything I have not looked at. Bring forward my fears, my jealousies, and my insecurities. Bring it all forward and let me work on it now. So be it. Occasionally, I must admit, I added a line to my mantra. From the Lord God of my being and to the mother, father within, I call forth all my unfinished business. Bring it all forward and I may finish it. So I'll be ready to meet the mate of my being. The girls and I were so close during those years that we couldn't have gotten a sliver between us. We were all we had. We lived on 900 a month for most of those years. Once I sat down with both Jennifer and Adriana and we talked about what to do. I worried constantly about money. I explained that we could move back to DC and I could make a lot of money again and their clothes could come from Bloomingdale's again as they once did. Now their clothes came from secondhand rows. I explained that I wouldn't be as available as I am now, but that we could have help and they could take music and dance and have the things they didn't have. We had managed to hang on to nice winter rental with large rooms and beautiful furnishings, but it was no longer in the budget, though we, though we moved out of it every summer and sort of floated around until we could have it back in the fall. But it was still out of the price range now, and we faced a wall of expenses, especially if I was going to try to produce a book. They listened patiently to my presentation of our financial situation, and they both intoned simultaneously, oh no. We came here so you could live your dream. You mustn't give up your dream. We can move somewhere cheaper. Nothing will ever work if you don't live your dream. And so it was that we located to a deserted trailer with missing ceiling panels and, allow and allowed insulation blackened with mildew to hang down into each room. To say the roof leaked was a gross understatement. We had no furniture with us and couldn't afford to move our furniture from DC. So we acquired enough furnished, loosely translated, please, our single wide on the beach. We got our queen-sized foam mattress from the dump. It was V-shaped with a deep crevice in the middle. We all slept together, me in the middle, one little girl on either side. I slept with little arms and legs sprawled all across me. We turned as one tangled mass, sometimes getting caught in each other's limbs. It seemed to always have a little, I seemed to always have a little arm across my face. I loved sleeping that way. Of all the things I felt anger at their father for, somehow every Christmas I resented him most. 
He had all the Christmas ornaments and lights in his comfortable four bedroom home in Ruston, Virginia, the one his father had made sure he continued to live in. He never used them after we left, I've since discovered, but he wouldn't ship them to us. And so we had no Christmas ornaments and certainly couldn't waste money buying any. One year, our dear friend, the island doctor, brought us ornaments from his tree so we could have something to hang. One year, we couldn't afford a tree, so a friend brought us a tree from high atop a mountain on an island where he had logging rights. It was a hemlock tree with beautiful green branches, much prettier than the trees of Christmas past. We hung a few little ornaments on it, strung it with popcorn and matarona ba- berries, admired it, and went to bed. When we woke in the morning, the girls ran out to see their tree, only to find it all over the carpet. Hemlock trees dropped their green needles inside. We were picking hemlock needles out of the carpet for days. That was the Christmas of Madura Branch. I thought it was quite a statement for the environment itself. No tree had to die, and a dan- dead branch got honored. I don't think the girls shared my altruistic opinion of that particular dead branch. We fixed the roof and slowly repaired the ceiling tiles, holding back the deadly insulation finally, but only after dozens of ear infections and one by one, we each had thrashed in the boiling temperatures of viral meningitis. I remember slipping through the dimensions and twirling through the underworld, a hell of sweat and burning. My head didn't hurt. Hurt doesn't even come close to what the agony felt like. It felt like my Mara was being boiled while I was still in body and I ached beyond the world and into this next. So I've talked about this before. The last time I was in India, I got really, really, really sick. I get sick every time I'm in India, but this time I had gotten an an infection from fecal matter. I know that sounds gross. Um, But my friend Mark and I were rescuing dogs while we were in school. Um, We were not in class. We were rescuing these dogs. And so we would jump in and out of the, the, the ditches where the puppies were. And I guess moving in and out of the ditches and then petting the dogs. And then it got in my, my mouth. It was human fecal matter. It's common for in India for men, especially to be able to go to the bathroom outside. And that is literally the sickest I have ever been in my whole entire life. And I've got some pretty gnarly sicknesses in my life, but I know what she's talking about. My fever got so high. I was in the hospital in India for days on end. My stomach was swollen. It got really, it's, but I was, I was, vomiting it was coming out everywhere but yet my my stomach was swollen and i remember at one point literally laying in the bed my fever was so high i literally thought i was going to die and i kind of wanted to because it, i was just in so much pain no matter what medication they give me gave me no matter what i took the pain would just not subside. I remember just crying in the bed because I was just in so much freaking pain. And so I understand what she's talking about here. And even though it's disgusting that that happened to me, I do feel like that was, um, that needed to happen. Um, cause I do feel like something broke through and that's something you learn in the East, right? We've talked about this before viruses, fevers, that kind of stuff there. That's not a bad thing, right? It, it upgrades you. It's a purging that upgrades you. These viruses sometimes are necessary. And I felt like that was very, very necessary. That was right before our world locked down that that happened. And um, so I understand what she's saying. Two horrific storms hit the island while we were in our trailer years. Each was labeled a hundred year storm, supposedly so ferocious. It could only happen once in a hundred years. We lived on the North shore of Okra's Island during both of them. Power was lost early on and water followed. We had a tiny Kent wood stove in the living room and a single wide. I filled one wall with the kitchen with wood and sealed black plastic over the inside of the windows and the sliding door and taped us in. I forced myself outside in the wind only once a day to restock the wood. I set an alarm clock to feed the stove every two hours through the night, but we survived in that trailer when everyone else fled the North Shore. Two other single mothers deserted their huge homes in below freezing cold, and we laid mattresses across the whole living room floor, and three mothers and six children held together through the storm in an eight-by-eight area. We cooked soup and noodles for days on that tiny stove. We thawed snow for water on the same stove and boiled our potatoes and noodles. I will always hold special fondness for Kent stoves. It not only kept us alive, it kept us warm, and it fed us. Adriana celebrated her eighth birthday towards the end of the worst, and we managed to drive into town to the grocery store. The power was still off, and the store couldn't even open its doors without electricity. 
They pried them open and forced them to par partially separate so the islanders could buy what few things were left on the shelves. There was one box of Duncan Hines white cake mix and we took it home. We opened the box and passed it among ourselves with shared utensils, spooning bites of dry cake mix while we sing happy birthday. It is to this day the best birthday party I've ever been to. Three women and six children survived that storm at a point on the island where the burnt hit better than 90 miles an hour winds raging down from Alaska and below zero temperatures. And we stayed warm and well fed with no help from a man. Somewhere, somehow, in the midst of this struggle to survive with little income, I did manage to do what I went there to do. I edited and produced three books based on the material I believed have come up from the great teacher and the win. A consummate accomplishment for a single mother living on 900 a month. Eventually, I required the rights back to the first two, self-published the last one, and even got it on a new age bestseller list. Adriana still says, this is the time period she remembers when she thinks about my power, those trailer years, we found out nothing could stop us. One of these books was on a subject of male tyrants. Though I did not think I'd ever experienced one at the time, one was on manifestation and one was on super consciousness. I wish I had known I draw into my life what I edit. I, I would never have done that book on male tyrants, but it wears on you, you know? The aloneness with so much responsibility. The school was dreadfully inferior and I worried about the girls' education. I could offer them nothing beyond the most basic requirements of life, though I had become a magician in the secondhand store. Deep in my heart, I was still lonely. I began to lecture about the third book specifically because it addressed a subject I thought to be sadly in need of understanding. Many people I knew held deep respect to the point of objective reverence and subjugation for whatever pre presented itself with the framework of what we consider deity. Send a voice and call it God or Jesus or Mary or any known master and people bow in reverence. But the same people who bow to what is considered deity within religion scoff at people who have communication with information source outside of our cultural historical frame of reference, i.e. aliens. How narrow. I decided it was my task to bridge this chasm between spirituality and what is considered alien consciousness and begin to speak on the subject. I've never understood where fate meets karma. And if we create our reality, what role does destiny play? I may never know in this lifetime. I will surely never understand how the same woman who left one man rather than allow her daughters to grow up in a loveless home could possibly get caught in what was to unfold. I thought about that question too. I've been really thinking about that a lot, you know, because we know we have Dharma, we have our fate, you know, our divine purpose, but we also have karma and we also have free will. So I've been thinking about that a lot lately. She says where fate meets karma, where does it, where does free will end and Dharma begin? You know what I'm saying? Like that's, a, that's something that we as humans may never fully understand um, where free will actually takes over Dharma or where Dharma actually takes over free will. I met a man at a speaking engagement who claimed to be something he wasn't, but I believed him because I wanted him to be what he said he was because I wanted the world to have such a possibility. I wanted me to have such a possibility. He betrayed himself as a great teacher and he played guitar and he sang songs. He told me he was native American, a medicine man who studied with great old grandfathers and grandmothers. He performed ceremony and played the flute and wrote songs he carried a sacred pipe and conjured images deeply held within my psyche. And so began my years with Eagle, the bear, spider, raven, and for white owl and the black fish. I hiked deeper into the forest and spent probably two nights of every week carrying the stones into the sweat lodge, praying and singing. The first two, two years we traveled with elders and I really did learn many amazing things. What I didn't know was that he was learning right along with me. He really hadn't known many of these things before we came together, but then I never experienced a real con man until him. And it took me years to figure that out. I did not know how cleverly the dark could pretend to be the light. Yes. And that's true. I mean, I find myself still making some of the same, same mistakes, even though I thought I've healed something. I can understand that. And that's a great line. I did not know how cleverly the dark could pretend to be the light. 
Slowly, he began a process of tearing me down, demeaning me, cutting me off from old friends, and taking my power over a, over a period of almost five years until one day I awoke to realize I'd become an abused woman. I'd allowed a man to hit me while I supported him. And I apologize. They are doing construction next door. They've been doing construction next, next door for quite a while now. So if you hear banging around, there's really nothing I can do about it. But it literally is right outside my window. They're building, uh, they tore down a restaurant. Now they're building high rises. So one day I was walking behind him on the way to the kitchen to make him a cup of coffee. All of a sudden he trolled around and piled a blow to my left ear. Pain showed so sharp it numbed numbed shot through me and i fell to the ground from the blow i spent the rest of the day in bed holding my ear curled in a fetal position from the pain i was deaf in that ear for six months and i told no one he never said he was sorry we just went on with life after all he was a great teacher and i was just a woman what else am i left to think about my desperation for me to allow such treatment perhaps because the abuse was infrequent and came literally out of the blue i excused it perhaps it was Perhaps I was too ashamed to admit it happened. Perhaps my childhood wound reopened. I was in the fifth grade. Right after lunch, one spring day, Charlotte, the teacher's pet, saw a book lying on the teacher's desk. Charlotte was the room librarian, and so it was her domain to check all library books found in the room. Alas, it had not been checked out at all. Ever vigilant, Charlotte promptly returned the book to the library and came back to the classroom. The bell rang and the teacher, teacher walked away took a look at her desk and asked where her book was. The room got really quiet. Mrs. Brown was especially mean to some kids and particularly nice to others. There was never a reason anyone could determine that explained her behavior or her choice of victim. On that, this particular day, Mrs. Brown walked across the room and stood in front of me. Judy, you took my book back to the library, didn't you? No, ma'am, Mrs. Brown, I said respectfully, to which she drew her arm back and slapped me across the face, propelling me out of my desk and onto the floor. I was stunned and humiliated. I had done nothing. I couldn't wait to tell Ruby what had happened. She would take care of it. Mothers always take care of these things. When I told her what happened, Ruby said, I'm sure she had a good reason. I have to teach at the same school. There's nothing I can do. I never forgot her response and lived out the repercussions for another 30 years. If someone hits me, I must have done something to deserve it. If I was raped at knife point, it must have been because I had no business walking along the road late at night. Before I finally learned my lesson, he attacked my daughter and wound up stealing everything we had accumulated between us. It was the very, in the very end, he almost killed me, holding me against glass panel doors and beating me back and forth across the face until I lo almost lost consciousness. The truth was finally clear to me. I had found a, fought a five year long battle with the dark side for the soul of a man and lost. We agreed to separate after the girls and I returned from studying with an herbalist. Instead, while we were out of town, he wrote obscenities on the bathroom walls with magic marker, packed everything, and left. He forged my name on documents that resulted in lawsuits and cleaned out the bank account. I learned the hard lessons of a male tyrant. We returned home and found everything gone. Everything, I should say, of value. He had taken the girl's new video player, bought with their child support, all CDs, all my art, my sacred bundle, all the furniture of any value, all running vehicles, including a motor home in both our names, all paperwork, even my address book. He left behind a hundred, uh, he left be behind 1,500 pounds of wet installation and trash everywhere. There were threats hidden inside jars and hat bands and a notice from a landlord that we had less than 30 days to be out of the house. The girls and I cleaned the house, sealed the walls he'd covered with obscenities, repainted, and moved within the deadline. I know how much the insulation and garbage weighed, because when we shoveled it off the rental truck at the dump, they charged me $180. When I looked shocked at the cost, they said, hey, lady, you just offloaded 1,500 pounds of trash, and that's what it cost. Without a penny to my name, that was a huge sum to be charged for dumping his trash. But insult to injury had become a way of life with him. He also deserted the two dogs he had brought into my life. I put everything left into storage, kept out one good looking outfit and took the only living spa space offered to us, a friend's tiny motor home. We boarded the dogs, the kennel, put three cats into cages stacked on each other and moved all of us into a space only big enough to sleep in alongside the cat cages. 
I borrowed money from Adriana, who had saved every penny she'd ever been given, perhaps just so she could loan me the money, and went to town looking for a house. A rental agent who had clearly lost her mind rented me an expensive old waterfront farmhouse on six acres of the most beautiful land on the island. I was a woman with no job and two teenage children. To this day, I have no idea how I got that farmhouse, nor do I have any idea how I had the courage to rent it. We moved in slowly and invited the owners to leave their old furniture to place rather than to take it to the dump. There is goodness. Thankfully, this gave us beds, a sofa from the 50s, and a dining room table. I slowly lifted my head from the paralyzing decay of shame and began to contact old friends, obtaining phone numbers one by one. I immediately discovered why he had stolen my address book. He called many of them and told them I had stolen everything from him and left him with nothing. He had told them I had taken all the money. He even told some of them that I had abused him. But here's the biggest shocker of all. Many of them believed him. Yeah, that's called a smear. Smear came from campaign from a narcissist. Narcissists will do that. What they're doing to you, they will say you are doing to them. And so you become the victim, the abuser when you're actually the victim. And they're really charming and they can charm you and trance you. So that's why they're able to get away with it. He had told the most amazing lies I'd ever heard. I had forgotten what a constant liar he was. He had, after all, fooled me for years. And I had hidden the abuse from almost everyone for years. I don't know why. It was infrequent, so I justified it. I kept thinking I had done something wrong to make him hit me. It came out of the blue. It was so, it came so out of the blue, it was hard to believe it had even happened. This was to be my first major encounter with betrayal. Betrayal is one of the hardest emotions to work through. I'm still working through it. I'm still working through it. I'm probably going to be working through the emotion of betrayal for a really long time. And the hard thing is like, once you've been betrayed, you have a really hard time trusting other people, which I'm trying not to be that way. Um, I'm trying not to allow the, especially with my AdSense situation, the betrayal of someone I considered a friend. I'm trying not to let that affect the way I see other people, right? I don't want to be jaded. I don't want to look at other people and think, are you going to do the same thing to me that this person did to me? Um, so that's a hard one. All right, let me reread that. This was my first major encounter with betrayal, and I watched many people I called friends choose to believe him instead of me. Until that experience with them, I always believed that there were two sides to every story. Now I know better. By that, I mean that I understand there are always two experiences in the grand metaphysical understanding. Everyone has their own truth, but there is no mitigation for abuse, verbal or physical, and there is no other side that excuses abuse. Absolutely. Absolutely. The final shock for me was when a girlfriend visited me one day shortly after we got our new house. She was one of the few people who knew about the abuse. She had lived near us and had seen his hypocrisy. She was also one of a handful of people who knew that I had stood by this man through his immense legal problems, paying for his lawyers with the profits from my own books to clean up his past shady history. She told me about a telephone conversation she had had with his mother during the months of legal battles. He had always claimed to be a Midas, a person of mixed blood, part Native and part Caucasian, or Metis, I'm not familiar with that term. So this woman had asked his mother which side of the family had the Native American blood. His mother had replied that there was absolutely no Native blood on any side, only Italian. She had confirmed that he was actually a full-blood, full-blooded Italian. In actuality, he was nothing he had claimed to be, and until the very end, I had believed him. I believed in his version of the legal battles, which portrayed him as a victim of the system. I believed his version of why I found different names on paperwork. I believed his version of how awful all the other women had been in his life, betraying him and deserting him and leaving him with nothing. And I swore I'd stand by him and show him how wonderful some women can be. I believed his version of where he learned and earned his medicine. And in the end, I was discovered he was not native, not even part native. Not only was he not what he said he was, but he wasn't even who he said he was either. I had wondered why he had different names from his mother and why his own daughter had a different last name and why the name I knew him by was different from either his birth name or his only daughter's name. He had been many different men in his life. There is a dreadful shame that comes from being the victim, whether it is abuse, ignorance, or both, as in my case. It is rather like being a rape victim. There's a terrible sense that you did something to bring it on, some horrible, awful feeling that somehow you deserved it. I absolutely understand what she's saying. 
in my case, this was, of course, the result of my childhood with Queen Victoria, who had somehow made me feel like I was very lucky she hadn't left me on a dung heap somewhere to start when she took me in as a baby. And the ideal mating for terror is when a natural abuser meets a victim of childhood trauma. In that sense, we were made for each other. Yeah, that's, that's true. And if you understand the perfection of imperfection, we both got what we chose to deserve, as harsh and awful as it sounds. As long as we allow it, we will be beaten. And when we value freedom above anything and everything else, we will choose freedom, even when it means the loss of what appears to be everything. The reason he fled when he did is because of my growing suspicions of many things. I begin to call him on his hypocrisy more and more loudly, risking everything in doing so. And I threatened to let people know who he really was and who he really wasn't. Had I saved uh, subservient and obeying, he still would be dominating my life. In the midst of my escape from terror, I drew a friend to my calls. A remarkable and wonderful man literally flew to me and helped me through this crisis. He brought his white horse to America from abroad. He told me there was nothing I could ever do that would make him leave. And no matter how hard I tried to push him away, he was there to stay. I finally yielded to his pleadings and I let down my long hair over the castle wall. He was the antithesis to every man I had ever known. He was grounded both in his business life and in his spiritual life, and he adored me. He listened intently to my feelings, valued my opinions on all matters, and he loved to touch and be touched. He held his hand over mine one day at a cafe in Santa Fe, took off his favorite ring, which he wore everywhere, and said, the next ring that will go on this finger is the ring that you put there the same day I put one on your finger. It will be the ring that binds us forever. It was a moment from a movie and I melted. I would have melted too. <laughs> That's a good lie. He did a good lie on that one. Was I finally safe enough to trust again? I let my hair down further over the castle wall. Slowly basking in his love and his co commitment, I began to relax. He helped me unravel the messes constraining me. He defended me. I don't think anyone had ever defended me before. We began a new business together. He adored the girls, and for the first time in their life, they had a loving, gener generous father. He gave Jennifer money for a guitar lessons, something I'd never been able to offer her, and he bought Adriana her own flight headset so she wouldn't have to borrow one when she went flying. He noticed little things and acted on them. He even drove to Jennifer's college to check out her potential housemate, lovingly interrogating them, qualifying them to make sure she would be safe in that environment, asking them all sorts of silly questions only a loving father would ask. She glowed in the attention. We all did. Love and appreciation are beyond measure. There is no yardstick long enough to measure its importance, no scale that one can weigh its immense value. I began to heal. And so when Christmas rolled around, I was determined to find the most special present I could, to thank him for choosing to be the amazing being he had chosen to be. I wanted to give him something beyond a thing in a box, something beyond measure. I wanted to find something to bespeak my awe and humble greatness to him. And that is how I met Tom. And so we're going to leave it right there, guys. Which, of course, Tom is the Sir Twin Flame. That's the man who um, channeled the first part of this book. So um, I think that's a good place to leave it. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I am thoroughly enjoying this book. As I've said many times, I've enjoyed the actual writings of Tom and now Judy over the channeling. To be honest with you guys, this is a very interesting, interesting book. All right, guys. Talk to you soon.